So we know that quasars have a weird spectrum with large redshifts. And so what we want to know now is what are they, right? So um, this key result from Martin Schmidt was that quasars actually did have um, hydrogen in their spectra, but at very high redshift. And it turns out how far were they redshifted? Um, about 0.16. So about 15 or 16 percent the speed of light uh, would be their implied speed. So the other factor that we have for quasars is that their lines were very broad, um, not as sharp as most hydrogen spectra that we measure from, say, stars or nearby galaxies. Um, so this could mean a lot of things, but it could mean that those quasars have some rotation. Right? So we're going to try to understand all of these elements, and I'll break it down for you step by step after the activity. OK, so thinking about Hubble's law again. Based on Hubble's law, um, what do you think you can infer about objects with very large redshifts? So again, I'll give you about a minute to type into the chat. And specifically, uh, what can you infer about the luminosity of objects with very large redshifts? All right, so to the first point, yeah, definitely the first thing that we get from objects with high redshift is that um, a high redshift implies a high speed and a high speed implies a high distance. So therefore, if objects have high redshift, we know they must be very far away from us. Because they're very far away, if they were any normal object, like an actual star, we would expect them to be very, very, very dim, right? But because we actually see them at fairly high luminosities, I didn't tell you that yet, um, at, sorry, at very high brightnesses, then they must have very large luminosities. So this um, just added to the mystery of quasars because it meant that these are extremely bright objects very far away. All right, so large redshift, we know they are very far away. And in order for us to see them at normal brightnesses, they must be extremely bright. And it turns out that they're about a thousand times the brightness, or sorry, the luminosity of a typical galaxy like the Milky Way. So um, the other thing that we notice is that when you monitor quasars over a period of years, then it turns out that their brightness changes. It, it fluctuates up and down over um, period time scales of about a few months, um, not over a, not a regularly varying brightness variation like for the Cepheid stars, um, but more like some occasional brightness um, spikes and dips. And those could be about 30% of the total luminosity, which is you know, quite a bit. If your light bulbs change that much, uh, you would be bothered in by new light bulbs. Uh, so when you have an object that has a thousand times the luminosity of our galaxy, if you wanted to um, make that much brightness by burning up matter, you would have to convert 10 Earth worth of matter to light every single minute. So clearly, whatever is responsible for the high energy output of quasars is working with um, quite a bit of raw material. OK, the other thing we can learn about this brightness change is the size of the object. So I have a little cartoon to try to illustrate that for you here. Let's say that we have got the sun, right? Here we are on the Earth observing the sun. And there's light being produced from the near side of the sun and all the points in between and the far side of the sun. So if the sun were to increase in brightness, right, we would see first the near side brightness increase. And then we would see, you know, the rest of it continue to be brighter and brighter and brighter. And then if it stopped being bright after some time, then the dimming would also take a certain amount of time based on the size of the object. So for that reason, we can, we can know that uh, the time that a object uh, spends at above its normal brightness um, means that there's a larger travel time across that object. OK. Um, one other feature that we started to find from quasars is that they had, they weren't just point sources. We could also sometimes see these jets. And especially in the radio range, we would see uh, oppositely oriented jets of radio emission. 
And sometimes these also glowed in other wavelength ranges from the opposite sides of an object. So those, you know, there's a lot of factors that we're looking at here, right? So I'm gonna try to summarize them and we're gonna go through these one by one and try to understand what a quasar could be based on this list of observations, right? First, we have the very large redshifts. Then we have, they've got very high luminosities. Um, they have short-term luminosity changes. They have non-stellar spectra, meaning they don't have a thermal shape, but then so they have kind of a just dropping shape with less um, radiation or less intensity at long wavelengths. Their emission lines have some broadening. And so we should be able to explain that. Um, they have a small size. This is what we know from their short-term luminosity changes and they have particle jets. So with all this evidence together, finally, it starts to point toward a coherent model. All right, so first let's start with this idea of redshift and the very high luminosities. Together, these two points mean that they are fast moving and they're far away, right? Um, so it could be, right? This, is, this model is that the quasars are actually supermassive black holes with an accretion disk around them. We discussed the uh, black holes previously, um, and we, we assume that the size of these accretion disks must be about the size of our own solar system. So the light that we see, right, cannot come from the black hole itself. The black hole doesn't emit any radiation of its own, um, but instead the light is generated from the material in the accretion disk. So essentially that swirling gas is falling in and it is warming up essentially by friction. And this causes it to glow with a normal thermal black body spectrum uh, generating heat and light. But because these are so far away from us, that's how, why we see their spectrum, right? Normal spectra, very highly redshifted. All right, so um, the other thing that this model explains is that um, there's, you know, some uneven temperature distribution throughout the disk as, you know, new bits of stars or gas fall into the accretion disk. Maybe you have kind of a lumpy accretion disk, right? You have little areas of high density that correspond to specific events of stars falling into the accretion disk. So because of that uneven mass distribution and temperature, then you're going to have some variation in luminosity. And then finally, um, you've got magnetic fields that emerge from the poles of the accretion disk. Uh, the specific reason for this is actually not well understood, um, but it happens. So the magnetic fields are strongest coming out of each pole and particles get basically forced out of the accretion disk. And once they're along these magnetic field lines, they spiral along the field lines and generate radiation. 